Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Editing Writing. This is episode 70, Book Coaching 1. My guest on this episode is Marjorie Turner Holman, who's completed four easy walking guidebooks. And the backstory is essentially her memoir of learning to find joy in the face of difficult life circumstances. Partially paralyzed, she gets outdoors using hiking poles for support. She is now a writer and editor and book coach. Please listen. Hi, Marjorie. Uh, welcome to the podcast, and thanks for taking the time to uh, do this. Thank you so much for making me welcome, Wayne. This is a fun fun thing. I, I love to sit and talk with people. And that's really what it is. So thank you. I also love to sit and talk with people, which is why I have a podcast. So I, it's win win right from the start here. Right. <laughs> so you've got a you've got a book series with a with a, I think an excellent title, my liturgy of easy walks, finding the sacred in every day, and some very strange places. And but it even has a greater story behind it. And uh, Thankfully, I, 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 uh, I, you, you sent, you were kind enough to send me a PDF in the last couple of days. I didn't obviously have a chance to read the whole thing, but I did dip in and read portions of it and got a whatever sense one can get of reading portions. And it has the had the, has the feel to me of a has the tone, even though there's a a pretty serious story behind it. It has the tone of a very, uh, in a way, breezily written memoir. It's a memoir, obviously, but it has yes. a, a light tone to it, even though the subject matter or some of the subject matter or the basis of it is anything but light. Do you mind uh, for uh, you know folks who haven't read any of it, do you mind expanding on that a bit and telling listeners about how you went from a serious injury and a long recovery and ultimately publishing these books? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's this book is really the backstory. Um, I've been writing walking books, thus the easy walks in the title that it refers to. Uh, I've been writing writing book easy walks books since uh, twenty thirteen, and uh, the story behind it is that thirty years ago I found myself because of brain surgery to save my life. Uh, the resulting when I woke up was that my entire right side was paralyzed and obviously I couldn't get across a room unsupported. And um, it was the past 30 years have been figuring out what to do with a changed life, which I, I think an awful lot of people can relate to. Uh, lots of us face things that we never expected, never imagined. And how do you carry on? And what do you do from there? So um, I was a single mother at the time of two young children. And it was a very scary time. It wasn't easy. It wasn't, um, gosh, God provided and I'm all set. Um, there was a lot of times it was really scary and, and not any certainty of what the outcome was going to be. And I have family that came through. I have friends that have come through. I met new people who have become friends. And that's a lot of the theme is, is what are the tools that you use and what are the things that come into our lives that make a difference and make it so you actually, you learn that everybody has something to give. And especially when you've been really ill and need a lot of support, having that sense that you're not always taking but have something to offer is really life-giving. So I, I'm, I may not be answering your whole question, but those are some of the things that come up for me when you ask that. I think you've said the essence there. And actually, uh, it's a really good point about how universal it is. Obviously, everyone hasn't had the same injury you've had, but and everyone hasn't had some, whatever it is that's that extreme, if I can put it that way. But the whole thing, I mean, about... Uh, you know, life is, um, you know, it's just uh, waiting for <laughs> whatever rules the universe to kick you in the head at one point or another. And the thing is, you know, uh, sometimes people 
react w well to it in the sense that they do what you did, that you say, you know, this is not what I wanted to happen, obviously, but that doesn't mean that my life is over. And other people, and I, I really feel for the other path where people either have the wrong attitude towards that and live a life of anger after that, or where either they don't gather assistance or they don't get assistance and they end up just uh, withering uh, for you know the next 30, 40 years or whatever. So I, I, do, I do agree. I mean, I could name five things in my own life, uh, not at the level of extremity that you're saying there, but um, like that, where you just have to say, wow, I, I was not expecting that in my life, but what am I going to do now? Well, I, I do want to stress that the first two years, I was not happy to have survived. It was very, very difficult, and I was very angry. So I wasn't this Pollyanna saying, oh, gosh, you know, God will provide. I, I had no, no certainty of that at all. It was really scary, and I was really angry. And basically, my kids kept me going as I searched for the medical help that I wasn't getting to begin with and uncontrolled seizures that medical people were indifferent or not really listening to. Yeah. Uh, that was not fun. I'm glad you mentioned that because I didn't mean to, I, I misspoke if I implied that. Yeah, it's not as if on, uh, you know, you have a, an injury on day one and then on day three, it's all happy-go-lucky for the next whatever years of recovery. Anger is very understandable. I, I guess what I was meaning was basically anger forever, basically oh, people oh, yeah. dying angry because of this and always, you know, just never doing, never going to plan B kind of thing as we had to do as we tried to set up our Zoom call here. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but I, I mean, that's fully understandable, right? That, that you would be angry at yeah. something. Uh, I find that anger still ultimately has fear behind it. And it helps to recognize that and to start seeing what we're afraid of and forgiving ourselves for being afraid and find, you know, persevering in looking for the help we need. That can be hard and it's no, there's no guarantee that what the help we get is what's gonna be what we truly need. It's, it's life. That's a good point. And it's, for some people, that might be counterintuitive that anger has fear behind it. It reminds me of the um, sometimes um, sometimes people who are the loudest and brashest and most uh, hyper confident and macho. It's all built on insecurity, you know, mm -hmm. all built on insecurity. And it's counterintuitive, but it's often the fact. And they either don't want to admit it to others or don't want to admit it to themselves. I just say that as an example of, yeah. you know, one might think anger and you affiliate that with kind of energy and I know right and whatever, rather than an essence of fear and uh, manifesting itself as anger. That, that's been my experience yeah. and, and learning to forgive myself for being frightened, for being anxious I'm a, I'm a normally anxious person about lots of things, but I certainly never dreamed this. So, you know, when people say, oh, I could never do that. Well, there's plenty of other things that I think about that say, oh, I could never do that. It's, it's sort of the devil you know, as opposed to the devil you don't. And when you have walked through any particular life circumstance, at least in my experience, I tend to say, oh, I can do that. I already did that. And it's the unknown that continues to feel really scary. I bet though, uh, and just to, just to uh, linger on this for a little more, I bet, the, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, the fact that you, of, of your super positive, I would say reaction to this and mentally healthy, I would say reaction to this, that must make you in a certain way, it's as if you've built up, what's it called, the uh, immunity, you know, uh, out of COVID. No, but in the sense oh. that you've, uh, you've, um, you've recovered from one thing so that if something else were to go bad, uh, you have, in a certain way, experience 
if you know what I mean, psychological psychological experience with how to deal with it. In some ways, yes, but very honestly, I'm just as anxious about other things. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I, people would like to think that of me. Of oh, you've been through this, so so you know what's the big deal? It's sort of like, well, it's it's everything else is no big deal, and I wish that were the case. Things okay. still feel like a big deal sometimes, and yes, I've got a really good support system. I I remarried. 16 years ago and have a wonderfully supportive husband. And that has made a huge difference, but it still doesn't solve everything. Yeah. And, and I guess what I mean is, I guess what I mean overall is that if one, and, and I hate to put it in these crude terms, if one were taking bets on if something went bad with you again, uh, I'd take that bet on, yeah, she's going to get through. <laughs> That's what I mean. I think probably it's, it's, I, I describe it as kicking and screaming. I, I wish that I could do it really gracefully and, and just have this positive mindset. And, and even, even things like publishing these books, uh, the self, the whole world of self-publishing, uh, those first books, I was, I was having meltdowns and hissy fits and, and just, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> It's it's no I, I I admire your honest your honesty about it because um, you know who can uh, uh, and this is the last thing I'll say about this uh, you know uh, perhaps in a movie somewhere someone might be suave about these things and everything is you know uh, looks is lovely and all that but uh, life is uh, it's not like the movies so anyway not just so far. <laughs> Maybe if George Clooney shows up later, uh, it'll be we can talk differently. So, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, and you just actually alluded to it about the uh, not only the books, but you also now uh, do editing and book coaching services for other people. And what I wanted to ask you about is just that generally, like what are the kinds of things you do? But are your clients exclusively self-publishing writers or not? Yes. Yes, yeah. I, I'm focused. Uh, that's who's come to me. Um, it also is through my the personal history work. These are typically people that want to write their family stories to share with family and friends. And I never promise to get people on the New York Times bestseller list. That's that's not typically who I'm working with. These are people that have a story to share. They. Uh, some want to write, some of them just want to tell me the story, and then I record and transcribe and transform it into readable narrative. So those are, you know, it's, it's, there's a fairly wide range of people that I work with. Mostly I, I try to get the big picture. And if you're writing it yourself, step back and be able to give them some perspective and some structure for what will make a compelling read for whoever it's designed for. So in a, in a sense, if I'm understanding right, you're in a, basically focusing on people who are, mem who are writing a memoir of some kind. It, typically it's memoir. I have also worked with some fiction writers. Um, yeah, most, most of them, it's, there's, there's only two kinds of memoirs. You would think there's a wide variety, but it, there's typically chronological, which is it, time passes. I was born, I went to school, I did something in life and I'm here where I am now. That's the chronological memoir. The other structure is topical memoir. Mm -hmm. And that typically focuses on one part of your life. And that's the focus. It may bring in lots of things in your life, but the focus is all pretty generally convey one big idea. And that's what my memoir is. It's a topical memoir. It doesn't, it, it's not chronological. Yeah, and I can understand. And, and those, are, those are great to read actually, the, what you're calling the topical ones, mm -hmm. because often it's not only topical, but there, it's emotional. And I mean, in the sense of it's dealing with emotions and psychology and 
uh, introspection and all those sorts of things, which one might not get in a chronological memoir. Chronological memoir may, uh, I mean, it might not just be a simple chronology, obviously it wouldn't, but it might be touching on facts that happened rather than and it might have to not have the time unless it were going to be 900 pages long uh, to focus on all the psychology and the whatever of all those facts that happened. Yes, um, my intent with my own memoir with these, they're really little tiny one to two page essays focused on more the emotion. It, it, they really are focused on the emotional, the spiritual part of how do you get through hard things. So my intent is rather than have the focus on me, that's my story. My hope is that as people read, that they'll be able to put themselves in that place and say, oh, that makes sense in my own life. So rather than the focus all being, look at me, what an amazing story, but oh, isn't that a, a, something that is universal? That's, that's my hope is that it will touch on universal themes. Yeah, and not only that, it, it touches on the whole idea of, as I uh, sort of mentioned earlier, um, I think it's fair to say this, I'll say it anyway, that um, a lot of people aren't used to introspection or don't have it as a kind of a practice that they do in their lives. And often they will only do it when uh, a tragedy happens or something like that. You start to rethink a lot of things. Like suddenly your husband leaves you and you have to do a lot of thinking about things. And uh, But day to day, it, 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 a lot of benefit can come from it as well. Just trying to understand your own character, right? Uh, so it's true. Um, so that that's another thing I think, excuse me for interrupting, no, no, but no, no. That, that's another thing about, I think that's the value of your story is that it, it sort of in a way provides, um, you provide a, a model, if I can say it that way, for, yeah, I can have a look at this that's happening in my life. And I can try to analyze it and try to learn from it and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's not only about, oh, wow, look at this woman's awesome story kind of thing. It's about, uh, I've had something happen to me as well, and this is worthy of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the word introspective, and uh, I never really thought of myself as introspective, and it's only in retrospect that I was able to understand that I, I do a lot of introspective thinking. Um, it wasn't something I really grew up with. There, weren't, there wasn't a vocabulary. And I read a book by Thomas Merton, The Seven Story Mountain, which was basically his biography, but it, it, it addresses, he was a, a Trappist monk and a lot of their work is prayer and introspection. And, is, and the mystical part of the Catholic faith. And I had not been exposed to that as a, as a pretty fundamental Presbyterian Baptist in the South is what I grew up with. Oh. <laughs> and I didn't have any of that vocabulary, but when I read his book, I recognized myself in that and said, oh, so I'm this married nursing mother a uh, monk of sorts, <laughs> though of course I wasn't. <laughs> but but on that other level, I knew that that was part of who I was, and I had never had the language to recognize that. That would make a great fantasy novel, a, mar a married <laughs> nursing monk. I would <laughs> I would read that for sure, definitely. <laughs> oh, how funny! Yeah, and and so once I recognized that, it's become a recurring theme and I hope that's part of the with the title the liturgy it yeah. really acknowledges the mystical intro, introspective part that I think a lot of us hunger for and and we aren't ne don't necessarily have the language or the tools to be able to tap into that 
I want to ask you about that as well, because in your in your one title, that great title, you have not only the word liturgy, but the word sacred. And those, of course, are fairly loaded words. I'm not a religious or even a spiritual person. I don't believe in the paranormal or anything like that. I believe that what I see is what I see. And this may be a dumb question, but when you use the word liturgy and sacred, are you referring to a traditional God? Like, were you always a Presbyterian Baptist believer, or did the process of recovery change you into something else? Um, I have always claimed being a Christian. It is something I've struggled with at times. Sometimes I even wanted to escape because of deep harm that occurred. And ultimately, I have not been able to escape that. And I've come to embrace that I am a Christian and there's just no getting away from it. Um, how that expresses it in my, my life has changed through the years, not just through my illness, but also through experiencing divorce. Typically in Baptist circles, it's extremely frowned upon and leaves you with few options. And, and so that was a challenge. Other things in a church that I was in that caused great harm to my family um, was a huge crisis of faith. And for a long time, I didn't feel like I had any faith. And ultimately, a, a very good friend of mine, as I was expressing those thoughts, he said, just give it up, Marjorie, you're a Christian, just stop. You know? right. <laughs> and I was grateful for that, because sometimes it really helps to have someone's outside giving, reflecting who we are and giving us that feedback as opposed to being in an echo chamber with our own thoughts. That's hard. Yeah, actually, that's a very good point about friendship generally, in my view. Uh, I have, you know, I have a uh, few friends, and but all the friends I have are of very high quality, and they don't keep me in an echo chamber. They don't tell me what I want to hear. They will, at times of decision or at times when I'm being a, a, a not a nice person, they will call, they will call me on it. Yeah. And that's that's the people you need. You don't want people just sort of uh, blithely uh, lip syncing with you, kind of thing. Not I mean, those are the friends I value as yeah. well. Just be honest with me, and I'll deal with what you tell me, and then I can be honest with you as well. It's it's the mutuality as opposed to putting friends up on a pedestal, or even trying harder just to make friends, accepting that. Sometimes those people that we wish we could be friends with, we're, we're trying too hard and yeah. we need to pull back and say the people that need to be in my life and that will be the most help are going to come on a mutual basis. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I would, I might feel differently if I had zero friends. Uh, but for the few that I have, I feel that the quality of them is so high that, um, and the other thing, of course, is that with them, I can just be the person that I am. I don't, there, I have no pretense, not that I'm a, I have pretenses in my other life either. I don't, I try not to pretend to be something that I'm not, but certainly with my friends, they've seen, I, I'm just, I just be who the person I am and uh, I don't get judged for that. I will get called on things, you know, if I express a stupid opinion, which I, which I do every, every now and then, you know, or if I do something wrong, you know, with them, you know, if I wrong them in some way, or if I wrong someone else, or if I make a bad moral choice, uh, they won't hesitate to, to call me on it. And I value that. That's what I want. I don't want someone just to say, like, whatever stupid thing I do. Uh, yeah, that's that's fine. You know, that's OK. Yeah, it was OK to, to to harm that person. That was fine. I don't want that. That, that I mean, that's pointless. Right. I, um, yes, absolutely. And um, in in talking about friendship, what came up for me was every time a person goes through a major life change, whether it's moving or whether it's a divorce or a death or illness, 
often I hear, wow, you really know who your good friends are. And what I've learned is that it's not necessarily that those people that had been in your life weren't good friends, but that when I go through a life change, I'm the one that's changed. And so the relationships are gonna have to shift. And you're lucky when at least a few of those people can stick with you. But for many of those, I find them, um, I call them friends of proximity, whether mm. it's physically close to you or emotionally close to you. When you go through a life change, you change and they may not have. And so that changes the relationship. So it, you know, forgiving those who aren't able to stay with you is part of that whole process of understanding they couldn't help it because I was the one who changed, not them. Don't you, do, you, do you also feel that the opposite applies where you, since you've changed and you now look at them and you think, I don't know why this person would be in my life so that in a sense, you're the person who, if I can use this phrase, drops them because they seem, because you're a different person now, they don't fit with the person that you are. Does that happen? Do you oh, abs oh, yeah. Um, some, sometimes it means that you recognize you just don't have the energy for yeah. that, that you've been able to put out before. And suddenly you just don't have the resources that you might have been. The other thing is that people come into your life, into your changed life that you might not have known or met otherwise because of your changed circumstances, whatever they are. And, and that has definitely been true. It's not a smooth, okay, you lost those friends and the other people walk right in. There's times in between that not much of anybody's there and it, it can be very, very lonely. I wish it were a smooth transition and that has never been my experience. I've also found the other uh, situation, I found actually for whatever reason, and maybe it's an obvious reason, but during the whole COVID period, which seemed to, uh, you know, I'm speaking as if it's over, it's kind of, I consider it over, but who knows? I don't know. Not I could be, I, I could be, I could be <laughs> dead tomorrow from COVID, who knows? Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the heart of it, basically, you know, for those two and a half years uh, uh, that we're kind of coming out of, uh, I found a lot of that where I started to have on my side thinking, why do I fraternize with this person? And I, it's not as if I, you know, you know, sat up at night and made notes or anything like that. But I just found that I, in certain relationships, I took less pleasure or, and it's not pleasure is the wrong word. I took less connection. I got less connection. And it just sort of, you know, thing just faded away. But the other thing happened too, the thing you say, where other people who were sort of, um, as it were, if you think of the theater stage, in the wings or the, mm -hmm. the you know, the second person who was going to back up, they came to the fore and, and you mm -hmm. realize that, well, I, I never noticed you there before, but you're, you're going to be awesome for my new life. <laughs> so it, it's a yeah. fascinating uh, um Thing, but you the, the the good point you make is that it's you that you have changed therefore it, it's no surprise that the people in your that that circle of dots of friends around you some of those dots are not going to be there anymore but other dots may or may not come in yeah it it took me a while to recognize that i don't really know when but i i at some point i got it that um, there was nothing terrible about those people that I felt let me down, that I was the one that changed. And, and for whatever reason, and many, many reasons, they couldn't be for me what I needed. Yeah. And very honestly, it, none of us can do that for many people because especially in crisis, it's really demanding to hang in there with someone it's hard uh, yeah. and you hope that that will slow down and it won't be quite as intense but sometimes it goes on a long time and that's hard 
Not many people can do that for you. And I think, and just to finish up here, because I wanted to ask you a couple of, just one more question about your, uh, your sort of your future editing wise kind of thing to go for the, sure. from this discussion to <laughs> something very pragmatic in a way. <laughs> mm-hmm. What's that from the sublime to the practical? Let's call it that. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah, everything is good. That's right. Uh, but a lot of people, of course, uh, often, I mean, you hear the, the stereotype or the cliche is the couple that stays together, even though they both at best dislike each other and at worst hate each other. And it's because, you know, one of them has changed and the other hasn't. And often they're staying together for financial reasons, pension reasons, we've got a great house and I'll have a lesser house if I move out reasons, all sorts of things like that. When the thing to do, you know, uh, I'm an atheist, so I believe this is all I have. This is the life I have. Break it up. You know, uh, every, it, you, you can survive almost anything. So you don't need to, just because you uh, signed up with someone, so to speak, uh, 30 years ago, you don't need to necessarily stay with that. I'm not encouraging divorce, but what I'm saying is that uh, you don't need to be stuck there. Have a look at what you really need and want, and you'd be surprised of what you of the strength that you have to be able to do something. Mm-hmm. I, yes, I, I absolutely hear that. And, um, probably, you know, whether what faith or not faith you're coming through. Um, for now, this is what we have. And being a martyr is not on my top of my list yeah. of how to, <laughs> how to get through life. Uh, um, there are many other choices that you can make. That's right. <laughs> Look good on a resume, though. Murder. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> too, too many. Oh, oh, I, I love C.S. Lewis. And he talks about the, the woman who lives for her family, you can tell that that's what's happening by the haggard look on all the rest of her family members. <laughs> it's not nice. That's <laughs> I've very, always treasured that. That's very funny. <laughs> so what I, what I wanted to ask you about the, here I'm moving from the sublime to the practical. <laughs> Uh, what I wanted to ask you about your, uh, so you're, you're continuing on with your, uh, you, you mentioned about um, coaching and editing and that sort of thing. And even what I would effectively call ghostwriting, if someone records mm-hmm. something and then you put it into words and they have a look at it kind of thing. I mean, I, that's pretty close to, if not exactly ghostwriting. It, I, you're, it is, it yeah. is. Yeah. So are you, is that, is that, you still do that? That that's the, the bulk of your activities? Um, I do what I damn well please. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't I, think God would approve of that word, but go, well, go ahead. You can blip it out. <laughs> but, um, I do what I please. And some of that comes from, uh, I, I don't work full time. I haven't been able to work full time because of illness. And at this point, having the support of a husband who, provides really the financial stuff. I'm able to do what I love to do and what makes me feel good. And I I respect myself to charge for the valuable work that I do, but I don't have the pressure to have to pay all my bills with that. So the bulk of my work, I, I work as much as I feel up to, but I get a lot of satisfaction from the work I do, like I said, it feels good to feel like I can give back. It also feels good that I have work that's worthy of being paid and that people feel like it's valuable enough to recognize that and understand that my work is worth the money that they're paying. But also too, I mean, just the nature of the work, you're not simply producing widgets, you're no. You know, you're the, the 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 kind of work you're doing is is helping people in their lives. I mean, that's that's a really good thing. You know, by means of writing or thinking about writing or writing a memoir or whatever. So that's I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. My my goal is to make you look the best you can be, <laughs> and and that's if you work with editors, that's the attitude you need to have because they're going to be telling you that doesn't express things. That's not clear. 
you need to say it, you need to rewrite it, you need to rework it. And that can be emotionally really hard to hear, but I've worked with editors for over 20 years and I've been really lucky to work with really good and some great editors and their wish is to make me look the best I can be. Yep. I would want to pass that on to others as well. Yeah, a good list, a good editor is sort of like a good friend. They shouldn't just uh, tell you what you want to hear. Great rating. We're ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's not helpful. Yeah. It's really not helpful. Maybe to your ego, but not if you want to get out and have other people benefit from your work. Very true. Marjorie, this has been an excellent conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time again. And good luck with uh, the practical and the sublime. And uh, uh, again, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. And thanks for persisting in making us get in on this conversation. <laughs> you take care. Be well. Take care. You be well as well. And that's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. Please take the time to rate me on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'll talk again soon.